Hey, thanks for clapping. <laughs> and you got my slides up already, I think. How are you guys? So nice of you to come out. I would be outside. It's so nice out. It feels nice to me. Anyway, we were in Paris all last week, and it was cold. Cold. Does it feel cold to you guys tonight? Well, thanks for having me, Tracy. Really lovely. What an amazing institute. I wish I lived here. I would come to all of these things. It's incredible. You guys might get Philip Glass in 2016. I hope it's okay if I say that. Pretty great. And thanks, Jonathan. What a lovely introduction. And thanks to all of you. Yeah, so I'll, maybe I'll talk and show you pictures for 20 minutes. And Tracy asked if I read. That'll take like three minutes. And then we'll have a conversation. I hope you guys can take part in it if you're interested. All right. Are you ready? Uh, I was an unusual kid. I could never make up my mind about stuff. I grew up in landlocked Ohio in the United States, but I collected seashells. By the time I was 10, I knew the number of every single player and their name on the local football team, the Cleveland Browns, but I also would go to bed reading Charles Darwin and Carl Sagan. When people would ask what I wanted to be when I grew up, my answer would depend entirely on whatever book I was reading at the moment. I read Call of I read Call of Wild and then I Call of the Wild and I said that I needed to be a mail carrier in the Yukon that lasted about a year. Then I read a book called Paper Lion by George Plimpton and I was determined to become a punt returner in the NFL. <laughs> Apparently, I was also into flowers. I asked my mom; she sent me two photos of me as a kid, and both I'm like watering flowers and all around flowers. For a year, I kept an aquarium full of frogs and tadpoles and bluegill in my bedroom because I'd read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and I was determined to become a marine biologist. Then someone bought me a book about Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect, and I promptly traded the aquarium for Legos and started building houses and telling all the neighbors that I was going to become an architect. In college, I took Latin American Studies, Nutrition, and Astronomy. I took the history of film and the civil rights movement and religious studies. To me, the course catalog was kind of like an all-you-can-eat buffet. There was not a thing in there that I did not want to put on my plate. But by the end of, the, of sophomore year, hopefully Dutch folks can relate to this. In America, you have to declare what's called a major when you're about 19 years old. So I made an appointment, I actually made an appointment with the assistant dean of my college to talk about the errors of such a strange stipulation. The assistant dean was a tall, severe woman in a green suit, and she told me that she wasn't prepared to abolish the policy of having students major in subjects and started flipping through papers on her desk. I said perhaps she could cut down on the number of courses I'd have to take in my major so that I could maybe take more electives. She asked me if I knew the definition of the word dilettante. <laughs> I said no. She said, look it up. Then she said that next time I come into her office, I might be more persuasive if I wear a different shirt, one that had sleeves, <laughs> which is advice I took tonight, you notice. So I reluctantly decided to focus on history. I declared myself a history major, but before I graduated, I still managed to sneak in Russian and constitutional law and environmental science, all of which meant that when I graduated, all of my friends went and got jobs, <laughs> And I drove to Telluride, Colorado, and cooked calamari in a deep fryer and skied moguls every day for 80 days straight. Then, uh, so I was 22 then, I think, 21, I drove to New Jersey, where my uh, oldest brother had, he had just finished two masters and a PhD at MIT, which is a very elite <laughs> engineering school. He would never, ever be accused of being a dilettante. <laughs> And he had been hired as an optics researcher at Bell Labs, which at the time was the most prestigious lab you could work in. He showed me his lab, which was full of lasers, none of which I was allowed to touch. And then he took me upstairs into a dark room, and he flipped a bunch of switches on a big machine. And he turned on a monitor, and he showed me this. Anybody guess what that thing is? What is that? Adams is a good guess. It's not right. It is the eye of a housefly viewed through an electron scanning microscope. The machine was a very, very expensive electron scanning microscope. The uh, simple, each compound eye of a fly um, contains between like four and 6,000 simple eyes. I wonder what it was like looking at this. I was just amazed. I was wondering what it was like for the fly's little brain trying to synthesize all these different visual inputs if it was like a security guard scanning hundreds of camera monitors. Here you can see it zoomed out a little bit. 
One of my brother's colleagues came in and he said, here's something that after it leaves its pupal stage, lives at most 30 days, usually about two weeks if you see a fly today, maybe a two week lifespan as an adult. And yet 65 million years of evolution have given it far more sophistication than the most complicated aircraft we can really dream of building. Then they showed me this. Everybody know what that is? It's a knife, very good. It's a dust mite. That is a dust mite that was on the house fly. These things thrive everywhere. These creatures, a single gram of dust contains about 250 of these animals that I can easily double and feather pillows, which you might want to think about before you go to bed tonight. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. Uh, I wonder, what does that thing know? Does it know it's even on a fly? Does it feel like this? I saw that and thought if the dust mite rides on the house fly, what rides on the dust mite? Sometimes you get stuck in your own head and your own life in the scale of your own days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Christmas, New Year's. You forget that yours is just one way of experiencing the world. You forget what's possible. I'll just show you a few other examples of things viewed through an electron microscope. Anybody want to try to guess what that is? Velcro. Velcro. Well done, Jonathan. That is Velcro. This one's harder, I think. We want to guess what that is. That is salt and pepper. How about that? Yeah, it's disgusting, right? It is. That is a human eyebrow viewed through an electron microscope. Right? Gross. How about this? That is used dental floss. <laughs> it's awful, right? And beautiful, but really mostly awful. I'll just leave that up there the rest of the night if I want you. That night, I went back to my brother's apartment in New Jersey and started writing in a notebook about what he and his colleagues had shown me that day. I tried to communicate curiosity, amazement, the simple grandeur of a housefly. And, and how it's really, it's very body communicated the refining power of eons of natural selection. What it's trying to do is render a sense of wonder in language. But I was an inexperienced writer, very inexperienced. And mostly what came out was more along the lines of that. <laughs> even though it would be years before I could publish any of the things I was writing, before really I could even admit to myself that I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. I started devoting whole notebooks to recording the things that amazed and interested me and that switched up my sense of scale and helped me understand my place or our place in the larger scale of geologic time or cultural time. So I'll just give you a few examples. Anybody know what kind of bird that is? It's a tern. It's a type of tern. It's an arctic tern. I bet you can guess who painted it. A French-American painter, yeah, John James Audubon, very good. Anyone want to try to guess the average weight of an adult Arctic tern? I'm going to have to do it in American figures. I'm sorry about that. 14 pounds is heavy. That would be heavy. Good guess. Three ounces, the same as this. Same as this dry. Three ounces, and yet, powered by little fish and cod, and krill, little marine worms, the average Arctic tern migrates about 43,000 miles. Sorry to keep using uh, American figures, 43,000 miles a year. These are the geolocation tracks of uh, 11 of these amazing birds they, uh, from uh, breeding colonies in Greenland and Iceland down through the South Atlantic and into Antarctica during our winter, the Northern Hemisphere's winter. Arctic terns see more daylight than any other creature on the planet, and they routinely live into their 20s which means many of them travel over 1.5 million miles in their lives. That's enough to fly to the moon and back three times. That's one kind of scale. Here's another. Has anybody seen a photograph of this tree before? A woman named Rachel Sussman is doing this very interesting project trying to take pictures of the oldest living things on Earth. And this is old Tico, and he is a 9,550-year-old spruce, a Norway spruce tree in Sweden one of the oldest trees on Earth. This trunk uh, sprouts back and dies about every six centuries or so, but its root system has been dated back to 7,550 BC. For, you know, invention of writing and recorded history, about 4,000 BC. Anytime I sort of feel like I was running out of time to choose a normal career <laughs> and start scrib stop scribbling in notebooks, I'd think of old Tico. I'd think maybe there's another way to understand time. 
I'll give you a couple more examples. What's the most abundant vertebrate on the planet? I was wrong. I thought it might be chickens. Anybody want to guess? You have to think about something with a backbone. Anybody want to guess? Can't be insects. I thought maybe rats, chickens, a lizard, us, maybe, homo sapiens. There might be 50 billion chickens on the planet. But I was thinking, of course, in a very narrow sliver of possibility, I was thinking about terrestrial animals. And I was forgetting about the ocean. The bent tooth bristle mouth is the most common vertebrate on the planet. It's a tiny bioluminescent fish that lives in deep ocean water, and very, very few of them will ever see the light of the sun. It's easy to forget that on average, the oceans are two and a half miles deep, right? Here on land, you know, creatures live within 100 meters of the ground, either up in trees or down below ground. But in the ocean, creatures occupy all of the available space in the surface water, mid water, and at the bottom of the deepest trenches, you know, six and a half miles down. So 99% of the biosphere, 99% of the space available to live on Earth is in the ocean. So if a Martian overlord sent you to Earth to bring back 100 species, 99 of them would come from the ocean. And 85 of them, 85 of them would come from beyond the reach of sunlight. Because 85% of the oceans are beyond the reach of sunlight. So by far the most common place to live on Earth is not the desert or the forest. It's in deep, dark, highly pressurized, very cold water. Which brings me to my last question for you guys. What's the most common form of communication on Earth? Song. I thought it might be song, right? Sound, some kind of sound. You think of whales, maybe, or birds, or maybe you think of celebrities texting each other. <laughs> but it's light by far. 90% of deep sea animals create their own light. And we know so little about them. In almost every way, they remain mysteries to us. For the last 25 years, a new deep sea species has been identified on average every two weeks. You can think how many we're losing without even really knowing that they existed at all. I loved reading about the deep ocean since I was a boy, reading 20,000 leagues under the sea. But I wasn't able to put together a good piece of writing about it until after I'd worked on something for well over a decade and finally turned it into something, a narrative, a publishable short story called The Deep. And that's really where almost all of my work begins. I get interested in something and then start pursuing it through research and then later try to build a narrative up out of it. That's true for hibernation. I became fascinated by the strange middle ground it presents between sleep and death. But it wasn't until I'd written drafts for years I managed to transform it into a story called The Hunter's Wife, which became a central part of my first book. That's true for whales, whale strandings. Why do whales commit suicide? We still don't really understand the answer to that question. And snow... Why does snow crystals bother to be so beautiful? And in the Pantheon, which is a focus of my third book, a book about Rome, how did the ancient Romans, without cranes or modern science, engineer a concrete roof that has lasted for over 2,000 years? We still don't really understand that. And the way memories are made, which was a focus of my fourth book. Why do certain memories remain intact in Alzheimer's patients while others wither? For years, I was trying to find these things that fascinated me and that helped me see the world in an unfamiliar way, things that seemed like unplumbable mysteries. But it wasn't until I tried to build stories up around them that anybody became interested in what I was writing. What I had to learn during the long apprenticeship since my brother first showed me that eye of a housefly was that to reach readers to share how dazzled I felt by the world, I had to learn to relate things on human scales and through human eyes. That's my kid on the beach. You can't just tell a reader this is awesome. You have to help your reader feel awe. And I think the way to do that is to transfer the amazement I feel for various subjects into the hearts of fictional characters. I try to let my own enthusiasm for something deeply interesting in the world seep into their lives and then hopefully like a virus into the life of a reader. Which brings me to the winter day that Jonathan briefly described 11 years ago. I was on a train from Princeton to New York City. I just finished a novel. I was searching out for a new idea, and there was this guy in front of me talking about Keanu Reeves on his phone. He was, you know, this is 2004, so this was going on in 2004. This was a hands-free adapter in 2004. This was that, you know, the size of that guy's phone. 
And he got unreasonably angry when his call dropped. You know, we're going 60 miles an hour, 60 kilometers an hour anyway. We're going 40 feet, 50 feet underground. And he's trying to have what is ultimately a, an incredible miracle to have this conversation. He's, he's like a god on this train. And he's forgotten it. And in a lot of ways, we all have. I feel that. And I get to my hotel, and I'm like, this Wi-Fi isn't very fast. <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? You know, he's using two little tiny... <laughs> Radios, a receiver and a transmitter crammed onto something, you know, no bigger than a deck of cards. Send and receive little packets of light between towers, one after the next, miles apart at the speed of light. And he's using that magic to have a conversation about Keanu Reeves, you know. I thought because we're habitualized to it, we've stopped seeing the grandeur of this breathtaking act. So I decided that I would try to write something that would help us feel that power again, to feel the strangeness and really the sorcery of hearing the voice of a loved one or a stranger in your ear. So that very afternoon, I wrote the title into my notebook, All the Light We Cannot See. Visible light, as you probably know, as Jonathan briefly mentioned, um, the light we can see is an infinitesimal, mathematically insignificant fraction of all the light that's pouring onto our world into this room in every second. Bracketing visible light shines so much light we can't see. X-rays and cosmic rays and microwaves and radio waves and ultraviolet rays. You can see sinister Google projects at the far end of the <laughs> electromagnetic spectrum. So that very night, I start a piece of fiction in which a boy reads a story to, a, I mean, a girl reads a story to a boy over a radio. I conceived of her as blind and him as trapped in some way and the sound of her voice carried by invisible light as a kind of salvation for him. But um, I didn't really know who they were. For a year, I was playing around with the story, but I, I, you know, I liked the parallel of her blind, him in darkness. I had a sense maybe that she could see in some ways more than he could, maybe even morally in that, those early stages. But I didn't know where and when it would be set. I certainly didn't know what story she'd be reading to him over the radio. I didn't know why he was trapped. I really didn't quite know who they were at that point. Then a year later, I went to France on book tour uh, for my second book, and um, this was my very first time to France. I thought Brittany was in Britain. That's how <laughs> foolish and American I was. Uh, we pulled into Brittany. It was night when we got there, so I didn't really get a chance to understand where I was or see the sea. And we went right into this restaurant, and there's a lot of like, Anthony, tell me about the meaning of the owl in your book. <laughs> and you know, all these journalists asking you questions, everybody's smoking. And eventually I kind of sneaked out after the long dinner and walked up three flights of stairs and found myself atop the ramparts around this medieval city called Saint Malo. And uh, especially because I was tired, I think I'd had a glass of wine. And immediately I felt like I had been transported into this Italo Calvino story. I felt like I had been moved to this place of imagination. The, the, it was low tide, and the moonlight was glittering on the beach. And when you're up on the ramparts, you can see into the second or third story of a lot of the apartment houses. You get to see people kind of sitting down to dinner. And I really felt like I had come to a place that was more of dreams than of reality. But that's where San Malo is. I'm sure many of you have been. And uh, I'll just show you a few pictures, some of which I took and some of which I stole from the internet. <laughs> And the next day really was a day that maybe changed my life because uh, we had the day off and I didn't have to do anything for my publisher. And so I got to walk around the city for the entire day and got to go through it and inside some of the buildings. There was a super tide there a couple weeks ago. You guys may have seen that in the newspapers. And I fell under the spell of these old granite mansions, centuries old houses of former pirates and fishermen and sea captains. And I said to my editor, like the stereotypical idiot American, I said, it's amazing to walk through a city so old. And he said, actually, San Malo was almost entirely destroyed in 1944 by the Allies, by, mostly by American bombs and artillery. And once I heard that, I really thought, OK, this is where I'm going to set the story of uh, the girl reading the story to the boy over the radio. This photo in particular, you can really get a sense of the, I think the city was about 86% destroyed in the period of one week siege. There you can really see it. That's when I knew I'd found the place where the boy with his radio would be trapped, listening to the blind girl on the radio. What was it like, I wondered, to live through a bombardment? And what in particular was it like for children? 
Off I went for another year reading about the seizure of Saint-Malo and the German fortifications of the Atlantic Wall and the occupation of France. I had to give myself another college education, so to speak. I read about radio waves and American artillery companies and French snails and the invasion of Paris four years before in, the, in June of 1940, which in turn got me reading about the massive effort to protect Europe's cultural treasures against the Nazis. I'm sure many of you know these stories. In the weeks before the invasion, with almost no notice, the whole city of Paris started shipping its valuables out of town at the Louvre in terms of cultural treasures. I'm sure many of you have seen some of these amazing images. These were taken by a man named Pierre Laval, Pierre Jahan. Um, you know, maybe you've heard of that painting, for example. <laughs> but, um, amazing. This picture in, in particular just reminds you that you know, the Louvre had become this packing yard, really, of all kinds of incredible um, art being taken out of the city. Since my interests skew towards science, I wonder what, what, what kind of amazing treasures would have been taken from the Natural History Museum, which I, I have a real attachment to the one in New York City. And I wondered, you know, I love the museum in France. I wondered what kind of decisions would have had to be made there very quickly in terms of removing things, hiding things. So I started imagining that the girl in my story and her father might have fled Paris from the Natural History Museum carrying something of great value. And I settled on a gemstone. There's an amazing mineral collection there. So now, after several years of being a dilettante in about 40 different subjects, I finally had a fair amount of the girl's backstory solved and started work on, the, on her narrative in earnest. I decided to send her to Saint-Malo after the exodus, where I decided she would have a great uncle and could safely wait out the war there. In the meantime, I needed to work on the boy's story. I knew that I wanted him to be from the other side of the war, so I started reading about things that um, might have influenced the life of a child young person in Germany at the time. One of the things I found pretty early on was the Volksempfanger, which I'm sure maybe some of you are familiar with. You guys are nodding. That's good. That's interesting. This was, in case you don't know, this is a state-sponsored and subsidized radio incapable of shortwave, really with reduced sensitivity, so that in most cases could only receive one or two, maybe three German and Austrian stations, propaganda stations. This is really Hitler's, uh, one of Hitler's many tools uh, for making, in this case, radio technology affordable to the general public, and really depriving his population of, for, of the capacity for independent thought. And then, of course, about the Hitler Youth, how German school weeks were reorganized so that, for example, Wednesday evenings and Saturdays were reserved across the entire country for youth activities, how compulsory service became mandatory for boys and then girls, too, which I didn't realize before I started reading this stuff. And about the 10,000 ways, of course, that the persecution of Jewish families was folded into daily routines. Companies had to show they had no Jewish employees before submitting bids to the government. Red Cross had to certify that no volunteers or donors were Jewish. Divorces were allowed on the ground simply that someone's wife might be Jewish. And about, which really factored in the novel, these paramilitary so-called Napoli schools that had been created by the Nazis for the racially elite. Schools where boys, and in some cases girls, were painstakingly desensitized to violence. All along, I kept asking myself what would become one of the central questions of the book, which is, is it right to do something just because everyone else is doing it? All along, I worried, how could I take a World War II story, a period about which so much has been written, and try to make it feel new again? Could I haunt the book of, with the specter of the Holocaust without turning to images that survivors had already used so much more eloquently and powerfully? And could I ask readers to empathize as deeply with a German boy as I could with a French girl? I was six years into this project and pretty much convinced it was going to fail when I came across this photograph. This was a boy named Hans George Henke. Has anybody seen this photograph before? Yeah, OK, interesting. Uh, I wasn't sure if it was ever a famous photograph or not. It appeared in an American magazine called Life. He was 15 years old here in 1945 when he was captured by the United States Ninth Army. His father had died in 38, and his mother died in 1944, and he had joined the Luftwaffe to support himself. He was a member of an anti-air squad. I was not used to feeling empathy for German citizens during the war, and indeed in many ways during my education I've been encouraged not to. But I pinned this photo uh, to the wall of my office and decided to try to use the lessons I've been learning all along as I was coming up as a writer, try to invest some of my own passions in the boy, particularly the amazement I felt and feel at the miracle of radio. You can really see that his, here his uniform is probably too large, maybe inherited from somebody who's been killed. And you also 
start to think, you know, at least in my imagination, I wonder if all these things he's been told, perhaps even on a radio like I just showed you, are starting to not pan out. And really everything that he's believed in is starting to crumble around him. There are 187 very short chapters in that book. Many of them are shorter than a single page, and I alternate back and forth, for the most part, uh, ping-pong style, between the girl, who I named Mahri, and the boy, who I named Werner. And the book embraces my childhood love for lots of things, puzzles and flowers and birds and mazes, and it took me a full decade to solve all the puzzles of its structure. In many ways, it was like going through the college course catalog again, trying to teach myself bits of German, trying to understand how military occupations worked, how the Atlantic Wall was built, one day I'd be learning about how bunkers were fortified, and the next I'd be trying to imagine what kind of meals a Breton housekeeper might have cooked with ration tickets in 1943. Eventually, I kept reverting to the lessons I'd already learned to try to invest in the particular and specific humanity of the characters I was creating, that the path to the biggest questions runs through the smallest particulars, that any journey toward the universal runs through the individual. I'll finish before I do a little tiny reading uh, with a quote from Wisława Zimborska. You guys know her work in Holland? Amazing poet and um, really an important voice. And she won the Nobel Prize in 1996, I think it's right. This quote was beside me almost the whole time I was writing the book. We all use phrases, she said, such as the ordinary world, ordinary life, the ordinary course of events. But in the language of poetry, nothing is usual or normal. Not a single stone and not a single cloud above it. Not a single day and not a single night after it. And above all, not a single existence. Not anyone's existence in this world. Without stories, we become trapped in the prison of the familiar. All we would know is the normal me and the stereotype, the other. In fundamentalism, the collective is everything. We is defined against they. The collective defines itself by lumping other people into collective oppositions. Systematic hatred, whether it's perpetrated by slave owners or the Nazis or the Taliban or the radicals that we, are, at least in the States, are currently calling ISIS, that depends upon objectifying people into groups and dismantling its adherents' abilities to understand and share the feelings of other people and minimizing the complexity of the individual. But in novels and stories and poems, we celebrate the individual. Novels, I believe, are uniquely qualified to offer compassion and empathy and attentiveness. In a good novel, openness is inherent. The lesson of every single one of my favorite books is this, the truth is more complicated than I thought. Reading and writing stories is not, despite appearances, about spending a lot of time by yourself. It's about learning to be able to look beyond the self, beyond the ego, to enter other lives and other worlds. It's about honing your sense of empathy so that a story might bridge the gap between the personal and the communal. I hope it's not too crazy to suggest that through fiction and poems, we can help combat unilateralism and stereotype, deepen our experiences of life, and even in incremental but important ways, nudge the world toward goodness. I hope that's true. It's maybe self-serving. You're like, of course, he writes books. He wants to believe they do good things in the world. Okay, I'll just read a little chapter. It's uh, two pages. Does it sound good? And then Jonathan will come up. All right. It's called Radio, and it happens quite early in the book, so you don't need to know too much, except that it's, um, it's a right around 1935, and that the main character, Werner, is an orphan, and he lives in Germany. Werner is eight years old and ferreting about in the refuse behind a storage shed when he discovers what looks like a large spool of thread. It consists of a wire-wrapped cylinder sandwiched between two discs of pine wood. Three frayed electrical leads sprout from the top. One has a small earphone dangling from its end. Yatta, that's his sister, Yatta, six years old with a round face and a mashed cumulus of white hair, crouches beside her brother. What is that? I think, Werner says, feeling as though some cupboard in the sky has just opened, we just found a radio. 
Until now, he has seen radios only in glimpses, a big cabinet wireless through the lace curtains of an official's house, a portable unit in a miner's dormitory, another in the church refectory. He has never touched one. He and Yetta smuggle the device back to Victoria Strasse No. 3 and appraise it beneath an electric lamp. They wipe it clean, untangle the snarl of wires, and wash mud out of the earphone. It does not work. Other children come and stand over them and marvel, then gradually lose interest and conclude it is hopeless. But Werner carries the receiver up to his attic dormer and studies it for hours. He disconnects everything that will disconnect. He lays its parts out on the floor and holds them one by one to the light. Three weeks after finding the device on a sun-gilded afternoon when perhaps every other child in the neighborhood is outdoors, he notices that its longest wire, a slender filament coiled hundreds of times around the central cylinder, has several small breaks in it. Slowly, meticulously, he unwraps the coil, carries the entire looped mess downstairs, calls Yetta inside to hold the pieces for him while he splices the breaks. Then he rewraps it. Now let's try, he whispers, and presses the earphone, earphone against his ear and runs what he has decided must be the tuning pin back and forth along the coil. He hears a fizz of static. Then from somewhere deep inside the earpiece, a stream of consonants issues forth. Werner's heart pauses. The voice seems to echo in the architecture of his head. The sound fades as quickly as it came. He shifts the pin a quarter inch, more static, another quarter inch, nothing. In the kitchen, Frau Elena needs bread. Boys shout in the alley. Werner guides the tuning pin back and forth, static, static. He is about to hand the earphone to Yetta when, clear and unblemished, about halfway down the coil, he hears the quick, drastic strikes of a bow dashing across the strings of a violin. He tries to hold the pin perfectly still. A second violin joins the first. Yetta drags herself closer. She watches her brother with outsized eyes. A piano chases the violins, then woodwinds. The strings sprint, woodwinds fluttering behind. More instruments join in. Flutes? Harps? Werner? Yetta whispers. He blinks. He has to swallow back tears. The parlor looks the same as it always has. Two cribs beneath two Latin crosses, dust floating in the open mouth of the stove, a dozen layers of paint peeling off the baseboards. A needlepoint of Frau Elena's snowy Alsatian village above the sink. Yet now there is music, as if inside his head an infinitesimal orchestra has stirred to life. The room seems to fall into a slow spin. His sister says his name more urgently, and he presses the earphone to her ear. Music, she says. He holds the pin as stock still as he can. The signal is weak enough that though the earphone is six inches away, he can't hear any trace of the song. But he watches his sister's face, motionless except for her eyelids. And in the kitchen, Frau Elena holds her flower-whitened hands in the air and cocks her head, studying him. And two older boys rush in and stop, sensing some change in the air. And the little radio with its four terminals and trailing aerial sits motionless on the floor between them all like a miracle. I'll stop there. I will sit right here. The most relaxed position I've ever done an interview in. Okay, yeah, a bit lower. <laughs> <laughs> These chairs do go back a bit, don't they? Yeah, it's nice. Okay, it's cool. can everybody hear us? Yeah? yeah? Okay, great. So, uh, I guess the first question that I, that I have to ask you, based upon this uh, presentation that you've given, and uh, also the passage that you chose to read is, and also, given the fact that I worked for many, many years in a shortwave broadcaster, <laughs> which is when you were a kid, did you spend a lot of time with the headphone pressed to your ear, tuning, 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 trying to find that voice in the dark? I did, um, mostly because I wasn't allowed to. I had a strict bedtime, and I loved baseball, and in the summer the games would go past my bedtime. And I would sneak up. I had a crystal radio that I had built from a kit, and I would sneak up and 
say, oh, I'm going to bed, mom. And then under the covers, I would listen to the ends of games. And then sometimes I get very excited and yell. And I think maybe my parents figured it out and I'm kind of tolerated it. <laughs> yeah. And then later, as I got older, I would go, I loved scanning, especially shortwave and trying to see how far away you could get a broadcast. And yeah, I mean, it's just an amazing thing to hear the voice of a stranger very far away living a totally different life. Suddenly, it's the same role books had for me, too. It's suddenly you're open to all these other possibilities. Can I, can I ask you, um, and this is something I like to ask all writers, and that is, what does your writing desk look like? My writing desk look like? Uh, yeah. I got Wait, it from my since father in law. It's very dirty. I should probably get a new desk someday. Uh, I, you know, it's cluttered. A lot of people send me things, so I have lots of papers on it, and I always try to just shove those into a corner. And it's covered with things, papers, and notes. And what, what part of the house is it in? I rent a, an office outside of my home because at home I have too many things to procrastinate with. Yeah. So I was tempted for a long time to have no internet at all in the office but occasionally I need it it's occasionally now people expect you to return emails like within 40 minutes of sending them so occasionally now I have to send emails or large attachments and I use the internet for research in some ways especially photographs I think the access to archival photographs for historical research is amazing and it's instantaneous and I live in a pretty remote part of the United States in Idaho and so being able to look at photos of old things very quickly is an amazing thing where were you when you wrote the passage you read? At your desk? Um, that's a great question. Probably, you know, all over the place. There, there's a fallacy that writers just, like, write something once. I mean, I wrote, I'm sure, some early version of that, but it probably went over it 80 times in 80 different places, hotel rooms and airplanes and at my desk and, um, you know, really anything that eventually makes it into a book. You've read through it so many times, you're almost blind to all of its flaws, but you're working on it all these different places, and you're always changing it and tweaking it a little bit, and mostly cutting crappy things out of it, you know? Yeah. When you, when you were writing just that one package, that one little passage, the, se the section, especially the very detailed description of the radio and the very detailed description of everything that was going on around Werner and Jutta as they were trying to tune that thing in and trying to listen and life is going on around them. What, we, what was going through your head when that happened, when you were writing that? Uh, it's funny, I mentioned my brother Chris in the talk. Um, there was a summer when we were maybe, I was maybe eight and he was probably 13 when he stopped going outside. This was the summer that Radio Shack, which is a company in the United States, released really the first personal computer. It was called a TRS-80. It's humongous. And he was, that summer he bought it and he just took it apart. He was fearless about taking things apart. And we were like, oh, Chris is never, you know, he's pale all summer. He never went out. <laughs> you know, we're like, what a loser. But of course, it turned out he had the last laugh in the end. You know, he's just, he would make, he made like the first computer games I had ever seen on that thing. You know, the hard drive was a magnetic tape. It was like a tape deck a the set. size of a set, couch. Yeah. It was huge. <laughs> uh, Is that where you were in your mind when you were writing that? Yeah, I was thinking about Chris a lot there. The, you know, that single-minded fascination with electronic things, he really had it. And this fearlessness about tinkering, he still has that. Yeah. So, not to put words in your mouth, but it was kind of like a warm, nostalgic feeling that you That's were trying to recreate. Yes, but the whole time you're in this terror that you're trying to m help your reader empathize with a kid who will wind up as part of the Third Reich. And so I was terrified all the time about it. I still am. Well, you know what? As long as you brought that up, why were you worried at all when you were writing a character like Werner, who was clearly going to be a Hitler uh, youth kid, uh, somebody who... Me and you and probably everybody in this room have been trained by 70 years of stories, other people's stories in history, to not find sympathetic. Why did you choose to make him like that? Why did you choose to, 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 to have a child who was going to be a Hitler Youth child as one of your main characters? Um, just to see if it was possible in some ways, to see if I could ask a reader to empathize as deeply with him. If you really believe fiction is a tool for empathy, um, can you a a ask a reader to understand his story coming, you know, part of it is their children, and so you get to see their formation into young adults. And Marie is somebody we're more used to empathizing with, a person who's being occupied versus the occupier. 
But I also think Werner makes a lot of moral failings in the novel. I'm not saying, I'm not judging him for that. I think I may have made a lot of those decisions too. I built a character into the novel named Frederick, who's a friend of his, um, who really in many ways has, in every way, has more moral fiber than Werner does. And really he's there to reflect Werner's mistakes. Even w I hopefully while you still, you're not rooting for Werner but as much as you're understanding why he's making these decisions that he does. I hate to give away anything for folks who don't know the book. Yeah, there's going to be some spoilers in this. It's kind of hard to get around it. Raise your hand if you've read the book. Oh, that's okay. quite a lot of you. Okay, all right. Yeah. Actually, okay. Pretty good. I feel a little <laughs> less guilty now. <laughs> um, getting back to Werner for a moment, uh, were you at all worried that you would be criticized? Oh, my for, gosh. Yeah? yeah. I worry about everything all the time. I'm up all night and worrying about everything. What were you, so, most, yeah. worried, what, what were you most worried about? Uh, in Werner's case or the whole entire book? In Werner's case, specifically in Werner's um, case. And then we'll get to the book. <laughs> uh, mostly you just want so, you know, f there, are, there is still, um, for the next 12, 15 years, there are people for whom these events are memory, particularly in Sam Malo. And it is so important to uh, try to render these experiences with historical fidelity. Um, so, you know, you can never do enough research, but at the same time, you'll never finish your book if... Um, you, you sometimes research can just be procrastination. You're just because of fear. You keep reading more and more instead well, what, of just what, what specifically was your fear? What were you afraid um, of? That uh, I'm not being respectful to families who were damaged by the Third Reich. You know that's what we were grown up. You know, raised to hate. Politicians still invoke the narrative of World War II as the clear moral war. This is the time when the Allies were right and the Axis was wrong. And of course, in almost every way, that's true. But in terms of individuals um, and humans, life is much more complicated. And it's so important to me that my children don't grow up the way the war is presented to them through video games and the History Channel. It's all very black and white and Germans are just getting mowed down in these games and you know so you, you don't were, think you, about them as humans you don't think about the f these little decisions that we make like what am I complicit in what are all of us complicit in right now those of us who used a plastic bottle today for example or those of us who flew on an airplane today or drove a car today you know what kind of global catastrophe are we complicit in that we just think it's okay because everybody else around us is doing it also. Yeah, but, but it's, that's all of us in it uh, together. You, you wrote a uh, lead character who was a Hitler youth kid, who, and, and you did that, and he, he was in your book. So I guess what I'm wondering about was what your actual, I mean, you're afraid of offending people. That's what it sounds like you're saying, yes? Uh, well, you're afraid of and not that... being faithful to history in some way. Yeah. But it's also a work of the imagination, and you hope your reader will allow you that. You know, I'm also trying to build a framework of fairy tale into the book, so you hope that your reader allows you some leeway in terms of getting every single detail right. Was anybody offended? A million books um, sold. No, mostly I get more things that um, I got wrong. You know, like uh, engineers will write you and say, you know, you need to move, um, you know, this formula is not exactly correct on the triangulation. There's a lot of triangulation in the book. Or, you know, you get uh, malacologists who write you like, this snail actually exists in this part of the Atlantic. And <laughs> people love to write you these letters. But I'm very <laughs> grateful. The greatest thing about e-books, I was telling Jessica earlier, my editor here is that, you know, you can make these changes. I just send them right to my editor. I'm like, let's make this change in the ebook right now. <laughs> somebody wrote me, a gem, uh, somebody, somebody who studies gems wrote me, and I called the diamond at one point octahedral, and he said, no, it's tetrahedral. So I spent like a half hour writing this email. I'm like, we need to change octahedral to tetrahedral. <laughs> Speaking of your editor, um, when you came to your editor with the idea that you were going to write a Second World War novel, just how upset did he or she get? Oh, yeah, I never <laughs> do that. Uh, unlike a lot of nonfiction writers, um, you know, I don't I try not to even describe the project I'm working on until it's done. So it's not uh, something you would say. Some, if you're really financially strapped, some fiction writers will sell a book before it's done. It's called it a partial or a proposal. But that scares me. I would much rather complete something and then deal with the capitalist side of the world. 
Yeah, let me let me just ask you also specifically. I mean, I you just told the germination of the story. I told the germination of the story. Um, but why did you specifically want to tell this almost fairy tale like story about two innocents who are slowly ground down by this adult Armageddon all around them? Uh, what was it inside of you that wanted to tell that tale? Um, that's one of those questions that, you know, um, people, can, you, you can't really choose your subjects. Uh, you know, those decisions are subconscious, and, um, you know, I'm, I don't know why I'm fascinated by radio as much as, you know, I just always have been, and I can try to articulate that only through telling the story, really. You know, it's rare that you ever sit down as a fiction writer and think, this is my subject, and now I will decide why this will be my subject. You just start playing around with it. You know, really, all of art making is some kind of play. It comes out of playfulness. And whether you're moving paint around on a canvas or moving notes around on the piano or moving images around on a screen or, in the writer's case, moving words around and sentences around inside paragraphs, you're mostly making things. Then you sleep, you wake up, you try to understand what this thing is you're making and try to make it a little bit stronger, and then you go to sleep. It's really interesting because... You went back to radio again, talking about your book. But it seems to me that radio is, in your book, a method that you use to tell a, a much greater story about what I feel is the loss of innocence, um, the, 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 the complication of life. Somehow you managed to achieve this almost, as I said, fairy tale like quality throughout the book. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that your book is about Radio. What do you what do you think about that? Um, that's again. That's something uh, critics are w far better at than artists. I think you know. I can't. You know, when my editor has to write the flap copy, the thing they put on the book to describe a book, it just sounds like a nightmare to me. I could never do that. <laughs> Flannery O'Connor said it takes every word of a story to tell the story, and I think that's kind of how I feel. The worst, I don't tell anybody on airplanes that I'm a writer because they'll say, like, oh, what are the books have you written? What's that about? And you're like, <laughs> oh, boy. Here it goes. And you're like, so it sounds to me like you're not really 100% sure what the major themes are in the book. Um, yeah, that you wrote. I mean, that's true. I think you know. Uh, I, I those things come. So much of your energy is in trying to make the world plausible and um, make this dream for a reader seamless, so that a reader doesn't wake from it. And then it's only later, when you're doing the dishes or walking your dog, that you start thinking, you know, what is this thing? And um, sure, there's all kinds of uh, play with light and dark in the book. Um, uh, of course, with keys and locks and restricting access to things and the constriction of access versus the uh, freedom of access. It was really important to me thematically to end the book the way it does, which I won't give too much away by just saying it ends in 2014 with an image of all the electromagnetic waves around Mahri. And, um, you know, my editor was kind of resisting that. And for me, that was a thematic decision. I felt like we need to ask ourselves, how is technology being used now? You know, the best historical novels for me somehow make um, some kind of inroads into now and the future. And uh, so I wanted to ask, you know, what's, what technologies are being used for um, purposes of violence now? And um, I think the only way to do that was to turn the book towards the end. So all that's a long way of saying, sure, there are times when you're thinking thematically, uh, but most of the time, I think 90% of your energy is on getting the language and the music of the language to sound right and getting the world to feel vivid to a reader and the characters to feel like humans and not just black marks on a white page. Ultimately, it's alchemy. You know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a trick you're playing on the reader. You're trying to make whole worlds, and all you're doing is using these really inexpensive materials called words. Can we talk about Marie Lowe? Because we talked about Werner, so let's talk about Marie Lowe. Okay. Um, how, how, how did she come into being? Um, like I said, I have, I envisioned her pretty early as, uh, visually impaired and maybe, uh, maybe a more capable, morally capable person than Werner. Now, why did you um, make her blind? Uh, there's a lot of answers to that. A somewhat reductive one is that my sister, my, my wife's oldest sister, my sister-in-law is disabled and she, even though it's a lot of work, she's in her 50s now, it's a lot of work being with her. She's so, she just sees the world with so much innocence and 
joy, and she brings joy to our lives,、um, especially around the holidays. Christmas is like an amazing thing with her. And I've always, so I've always just been fascinated trying to depict、uh, the abilities of disabled people without romanticizing. I hope Marie still comes across as her life was very difficult. But,、um, and then when I started reading memoirs of、um, people who had gone blind in their childhood and how,、um, in many ways, the brain is so plastic and the way it remapped them to see colors and to、um, use music, for example, and of course books,、uh, then I thought, okay, I've got my character. She'll love books and she'll be an intellectually curious person. And how can I help her find her way to, st- to maintain an intellectual curiosity during the occupation when everything is so restricted? I thought at some point you'd say, because she can't see light. Yeah, and, I mean,、uh, maybe that's that part, that of, part it of it. Too. Yeah. Maybe? Or... Sure, yeah, you're just kind of <laughs> fumbling your way through. Thematically, it does fit, though, yes. But I, I mean, for me, it's so refreshing visiting students in particular because the English teacher will say things like, you know, what does this represent? And for me, that's for the reader to decide. You know, I don't, I don't ever have a very overt idea about what certain things will represent. The idea that a theme can be pulled out of a story, Flannery O'Connor again said, it's like the, the string on a feed of chicken,、uh, you know, a sack of chicken feed that you can pull the theme out and look at it. It's never seemed、um, to her like an appropriate metaphor, and it doesn't seem like that to me either. It's all integrated into the whole of it. You know, perhaps this is.、Uh A little too Dutch centric、uh, on my part.、Uh, but when Marie Laure was、uh, hiding from、uh, the German sergeant in the attic,、um, it sort of reminded me of another girl hiding in an attic from the Germans、hmm. um, in Amsterdam.、Uh, who could that be?、Uh, did that, I mean, I, I can't possibly be the first person to have brought this up yeah, to you. Yeah, of course. Um, no, that book was hugely important to me. You know, my w- sons are here with me, and my wife is reading that to them while they're in Amsterdam.、Um, for me, that book was so important to me because it, it teaches you about how books help the dead live again. For, for the world, that girl's voice lives inside that language still.、Um, and that's what writing can do it's this intoxicating democratic magic. You know? Were you at all thinking of Anne Frank during that passage? Was that、uh, a, an inspiration,、sure. or is it just coincidence? Um, you're certainly never thinking, like, now I will write a parallel of Anne Frank. <laughs>、uh, mostly you're worried. You know, you think,、uh, you know, can I use、uh, an image of an attic、uh, in any way anymore?、Um, especially tying it to World War II. You worry that somehow through repetition, things lose their power. But in terms of the mechanics and the choreography of the story, I needed her to be in an attic. There's really no other logical place that you could broadcast from than very high in the tall buildings. And so I thought that's where I need that radio to be. So it's, it's just a coincidence, just to be 100% clear on this.、Uh, yeah, no, I, it's definitely not just a coincidence. Certainly it was in my mind. Oh, it was? I mean, that、okay. story is part of, of one of the many things I've read set during World War II. So, sure, of course. Okay.、Um, It took you how long to write this book? Ten years. But I, was,、uh, I get so overwhelmed, particularly reading about the Eastern Front and the destruction of human beings on the Eastern Front, that、uh, there w- would be times where I'd take a break from the material and write other things. So it wasn't like I worked every single day for ten years.、Um, you know, there were days, especially when, if I wasn't teaching, where that's all I would do all day is read about the destruction of human beings. And so I would.、Um, Try to maybe take a month off and work on other projects. Yeah. Ten years is a really long time. Were there, were there moments when you would become completely frustrated with the book?、Maybe、yes, of course. Yeah? Yeah, that's true with any long project.、Um, I mean, doubt is a big part of making things and、um, failure, and you, you're always tr- it's always trial and error for me. And so you. you Try scenes, and you have to. So much of maturity as an artist, whatever form you want to work in, is learning to get rid of things that took a long time to make.、Um, whether you're writing songs or making films or making paintings, and、um, it's all just you have to tell yourself it's a very windy path through the darkness to try to get from point A to point B, but you have to kind of take that path. And, and that's really the joy of being an artist. If you knew how something was going to end or what it would look like, it wouldn't be fun to make the thing. What was the, the lowest point of the process for you? Oh, man, there were several. There were lots of times when I thought I'll never finish it. Um, and, um, where, where was the moment when you thought to yourself, why did I ever become a writer? 
I'm going to go get a job at McDonald's. Oh, yeah. Those happen all the time. That happened today <laughs> on the train up here. Uh, you know, anytime you're trying to make something, it's scary. And fear can stop you in so many ways. I see it in friends who are novelists who have published 10 books, and I see it in students who are trying to write their first book. You know, they're just so afraid they can't embrace the fact that, of course, you're, you'll fail. Human language is an attempt to articulate the inarticulable, to really describe the glowing, shimmering, amazing thing that is a tree. Words don't quite all the way get there. But sometimes you can combine them in a way that um, some sublimity, the reader meets you halfway, and somehow together you can make some kind of connection that is approximates the beauty of the world or an experience. Well, what, do you, what do you do when you have one of your deep, dark moments of anxiety, fear, feeling like a failure, what do you, how do you get out of it? Um, you can remind yourself that you've done it before, that, you know, grit is something that gets a lot of projects done. Um, and so you can say, you know, this will pass, but it doesn't always help. You know, in a lot of ways writing, there's a parallel to working out. You know, there are days when you're like, oh my gosh, I do not want to exercise today. But when you do, you feel better. So you just try to make yourself do it in the morning. And even if it's a miserable day and it's not going well, at least you've done it. And then you feel a little lighter for the rest of the day. So 10 years is a long time to write a book. How did you know you were done? Uh, that's something I don't struggle with as much as... Um, some certainly some of my students, uh, you know, there's the old saw about when you start going through it and taking all the commas out, and then the next day you go through and put all the commas back in. That's kind of a sign that you're just tinkering with minutia. Um, that's another kind of fear. Uh, uh, for me, I think I felt like it was done when I'm ready to show it to my wife, and you know, it's not perfect by any means, but you're ready to show it to another human being, you know, and then they help you articulate maybe what's not working, and you start going back. It's like you build this car in your garage, and you think it runs, but it doesn't really run. Then you have to take it apart, and then your editor ta makes you really take it apart and put it back together. I just wonder what that moment was like when you, because, you know, a decade passed. Uh, Bush was already out of office. Sure, yeah. you know, we were into the Obama Thankfully. era, as you pointed out. And then you finally, you know, you're sitting there at your computer, and you put in that last period, and then you think to yourself, well, that's, that's the novel. <laughs> yeah, I've done right. that. That's the nut. It's you know. more like, gosh, my neck hurts and I'm starving. <laughs> and I, uh, sometimes you're writing while you know you want to eat for six or seven hours. You're like, where am I? I need to move around. So uh, for me, it was more a relief that if my computer failed and the hard drive I store in my freezer had failed, that you know the thing is done and my wife doesn't have to go after my death if I get hit by a bus or something and piece together all these terrible chapters and try to make something. At least it's done in that sense. You, you can print it out. You, you mentioned your wife a lot. It was when you printed out the thing and you brought it to her and you said, I'm, I'm done. what did you say to her when you, when you brought it to her? And then what did she say? Uh, well, she had been reading, so she was just wanting to read more, and then she gets very angry about what happens to the characters. Oh, what, what, what did she get most angry about? Oh, uh, well, I probably can't talk about that unless people <laughs> finish the book. The same thing a lot of readers are getting mad at me about. Oh, what are, what are readers getting mad at you about? Oh, I, well, I won't spoil it, so... <laughs> I, I'm only saying this because I did an event uh, maybe three or four weeks ago in the States with like a thousand people at it, and a woman asked me about Werner and at the end, towards the end of the event, and the whole crowd turned on her. It was ruthless. <laughs> They're like, boo, and she left. She left the, she left the auditorium. So I'm, no, I don't want to alienate anybody who hasn't read the book. Okay. We won't go there. Okay. Except about the fact that Ver No, I won't say it. <laughs> so, um... Just a couple more questions. Oh, sorry, guys. Just a couple more questions, and then I'm going to throw it out there to you, good folks. Um, I, I guess um, has Hollywood come a, come a calling yet? Um, yeah, the option sold the day the book came out, but that doesn't mean all that much. It does, and it doesn't. Um, well, you did it at the gasp, so maybe it does. Um, you know, with same thing with stories. When an option gets sold, it's exciting, but I've learned to realize that it's <clears throat> impossible to make a film and you need so many pieces to fall in. And I'm much more interested in prose. I, as a novelist, you can make buildings explode and characters age and costume changes, and you don't have to think about capitalism. 
And filmmakers have to think about all of that. So, oh, we can't have this building explode because that's going to cost but a lot of money. But at least Hollywood, <laughs> but at least Hollywood optioned it. So now we have the opportunity to fantasize. Yeah, no, about who good. can star in the movie? I guess. Yeah, it's good. So I who would know. play Werner? Oh my, I'm not the <laughs> right person child to actors. ask. What? Who I would you like to direct it? Oh, I don't know any of those questions. Scott Rudin is the producer attached to the film, and it's at the place called Fox Searchlight, and they make some nice looking films. But I'm not in that world, and uh, I know. But you, do you so. watch movies? You like movies? I do, but I don't always remember the names of actors or no. anything. You, you don't. Have I would like, like a... Herman Melville to play Werner, <laughs> <laughs> and Virginia Woolf to play Marie. <laughs> There are websites that do that. There's some website that picks the actors. And <laughs> Somehow I feel like you're not taking this question seriously. <laughs> I think it's good to let... Uh, you know, collaborative arts fascinate me, and I'm very jealous of them. You know, uh, uh, making stories by yourself is a strange and lonely thing, and I love that filmmakers get to have an actress contribute. You know, the, a scriptwriter can kind of have what she says, but maybe she changes the line, and maybe the director changes the line, and... I get quite jealous of that. I think that would be an amazing experience to be a part of. Certainly at the theater, I think it's so neat to see a play change so much depending on who stars in it, who directs it. And, uh, as a novelist, you just hope it's in good hands. And How have the people of Saint Malo reacted to the book? Uh, it's a good question. It comes out on May, May 5th, 6th, something like that in France. So I'll get to go. There's a festival there. That's why I originally went. Uh, so I'm excited to do that event and see friends and see the city and you know the city's on the jacket of the French edition so it'll be interesting to see okay so I'm gonna take this now I'm gonna come out to you folks is this on is this on it is okay uh, does anybody have a question and I will come to you yes ma'am I come down to you what's your name did you want to stand up what's your name Maddie Baking okay and your question is do you want me to hold it? Or you, okay. I'll hold it. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going to not ask any of the questions I'm dying to ask oh, that will give things away. Ending. Okay. So um, in the way the novel is structured, where you flip back and forth between different years, and then there are these short chapters, and then, of course, there's the gem that you referenced that we won't talk about that is in, you know, moves around. Yeah. I was um, wondering if you were um, intentionally paralleling kind of the puzzles and the models that Marie uses and that her father makes for her that she opens every year. Um, and if that was something that, or how that came to be, and one, if you are kind of modeling it after that, and two, how you made that decision. And I won't ask the other questions. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Maddie. That's a nice question. Um, yeah, Marie's father builds puzzle, builds little maquettes of cities for her, but also uh, puzzles. And yes, very intentionally, I was trying to play around with puzzle making and um, uh, really make the reader kind of try to solve a puzzle along the way. Uh, also, I, um, I knew I'd have to break chronology quite early because I'm asking the reader to do um, quite a bold thing in that the, the main characters don't meet until about page 450. They're not in the same room. And so I thought, th this is too much of a risk. I need to at least suggest that they'll be in the same town. So I thought, at least if I open by saying, yeah, they're pretty close to each other, reader, and now you're going to watch them get closer. In some ways, it's... Um, I have a friend, a writer named Steve Allman, who says, um, suspense is when you take a gun out of your bag and set it on the table at the beginning of a class and say, at the end of class, somebody will get shot with this gun. And surprise is you have the whole class, and at the end, you pull the gun out and shoot somebody with it. And I much prefer suspense. So I think it's a little more interesting to say, you know, they'll be close to each other and just bear with me for these next 400 pages, <laughs> and I promise they'll intersect. But it was also very liberating to make that decision because I thought, okay, nobody will read this. Nobody's going to put up with this. So then suddenly I'm free. I don't have to worry about alienating my reader. My mom and my wife will be the only people who read it, and that'll be okay. And yeah, so then in terms of continuing that, that A-B back and forth, that ping-ponging, I just kept thinking of it as plates spinning. You guys know what I mean? Like plates spinning on poles and magicians trying to get like six or seven of them going. I wanted to you to keep Marie and Werner in their childhood and in their young adulthood, all of that in their mind. Maybe Von Rumpel, this character, also spinning in your mind. I felt the only way to do that is to keep going back pretty quickly and touching each plate and keep them all spinning and see if I could do that in a reader's mind. It asks a lot of the reader. So then I try to be generous in terms of white space by rewarding the reader with these long breaths between these kind of lyrical sections of the chapters. 
I don't what know. do you mean by white space? Could you just white space define is that just um, sure. And, you know, anywhere if you look at a book and you see on a page, uh, you know, white space is places that there aren't words. So any, you know, if you're ending a chapter early, if you have dialogue, you know, those are more reader friendly sections. And it's not necessarily something healthy to think about being friendly to your reader all the time. But I do think about. A uh, reader has a certain limited amount of energy, and where do you want to put her energy? Do you want it um, focusing on the language? Do you want her to be seeing images? Do you want her to be paying attention to the fact that language is telling this the way a writer like William Gass or sometimes David Foster Wallace or Virginia Woolf wants you to? In most cases, I want the language to disappear and images to come to the reader. And uh, occasionally, I want the music of the language to overwhelm the passage. And then I think it's n friendly to give the reader a break. So that's what I mean by white space. Next question. Ah, I'm going to go all the way to the back, and then you, ma'am. Yeah. So your name is? Uh, Yvette Sendis. And your question? So first of all, I wanted to say, to me, it was a radio book, because I was another one of these kids who was trying to get Australia on shortwave. And now I'm a radio astronomer, so I'm trying to get oh, signals wow. really far away. That's amazing. But uh, thank you. But uh, the thing for me, uh, there was a very big parallel for Werner. He was actually had the same first name as another very important Nazi figure at the time, Werner von Braun, which for anybody in the audience who isn't familiar, he was basically the man who invented the V2 rocket which attacked London. He used uh, slave labor in part. Uh, not Jewish people built these rockets. But then the Americans later forgive, forgave him, and he sent us to the moon. He built the Saturn V rocket. Uh, so I was wondering, because he's one of the most you know, complex characters, I think, at that time in uh, technology, were you thinking about Werner von Braun when you were writing mm -hmm. Werner's character? Uh, that's a great question. Um, only in terms of, uh, well, f first of all, Thomas Pynchon's novel, uh, Gravity, Gravity's Rainbow really, I mean, it, uh, you know, it was a really important book to me maybe when I was 20, so that was always a, a, an influence, a huge influence. And then uh, in terms of naming Werner, um, yeah, I like names to have some level of meaning, and you think maybe I can invoke, for a reader who has that association in her head, maybe you can make that association. But, you know, I worry about all that stuff, too. You know, Mahri Lore, her last name is LeBlanc, the white, and you start thinking, am I playing around too much with this color and blindness and darkness and light thing? I mean, I might as well just name her Mahri Dark or something, you know. Uh, so you, sometimes you can be a little too heavy-handed and overt. So, yes, if a reader wants to make that association, I'm grateful for it, and I'm glad it's available to her, but I don't want to force it either. Can I ask you an admittedly unfair question? Yes, everybody, turn around now and look at me. Um, if you had to pick, because you write about science as well, you write a, a column. I write about science books, yes. Yeah. If you had to pick, would you want to be a novelist or be a science writer? That's what I was saying my whole talk. I've done my whole life so that I don't have to choose. <laughs> I, I organized my entire life to avoid that decision. I feel like it's very artificial. We were talking briefly at dinner about um, you know f children maybe being too young to have to f decide a specialization. And it sounds like in uh, Holland maybe you have to make that decision even sooner. And uh, for me, it seemed very artificial to have the the literary arts building and the science building at opposite ends of the campus, as if somehow they're not. S both about asking why humans are here and what is the search for the unknown and what is uncertainty, you know, and that's something that I think both good scientists and um, literature is about, is trying to understand our place here. So um, I think I've hopefully found a career that allows me to read as much about um, scientific inquiry as I would like and also still tell stories. So. Mm -hmm. you, you had the question then? Would you stand up, please? And your name? Suzanne. Uh, I, first of all, I just wanted to say we, this is our book group from the American Women's Club. Oh, great. And we just had a little meeting. And we're, it's just thrilling to be here to hear you speak after enjoying the book together. Um, so I'm wondering, you've mentioned Flannery O'Connor and Thomas Pynchon. Who are some other writers that have been mentors or best friends for you along the years? Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. Um, 
Certainly, in terms of living writers, um, the writer from the American Southwest, Cormac McCarthy, in mm. terms of his attention to landscape, you know, I'm, um, in terms of a best friend, I've never met him, but I've, he's the one of the few living writers. He, he, he and J. M. Kotsia, the South African writer, who every book they write, I will buy right away and read. Maybe Ishiguro too, although I haven't read the newest one. Um, That's our next. Book. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah, good. I've heard all kinds of different, strange things. I love how surprising he is. It's got magic and dragons in it. It's called The Buried Giant. Um, and, uh, there's a Canadian poet named Ann Carson, who I adore. I think everything she writes is fascinating. She's, um, she's a classicist also and translates um, from Latin and Greek, I think. And her poetry is beautiful. She's been a big influence. There's a writer who n not enough people read named Andrea Barrett. Has anybody here read? Oh, yeah, you know all kinds of things. She's wonderful. She's wonderful. It's amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. She has a book called Ship Fever and then The Voyage of the Narwhal. Um, she was, when I found her and she was telling stories about scientists or historical scientists and telling fictional stories about them, I felt like it gave me such permission to do that. She pays attention to the natural world in a way that, say, um, a lot of nonfiction writers who I'd loved coming up, like Aldo Leopold or Annie Dillard or Edward Abbey, you know, wrote about um, even Wordsworth. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can maybe make stories and pay attention to science and nature. And uh, so she gave, I feel like she gave me permission to do that by reading her work. Those are three living writers, anyway. Yeah. It's funny, when you mentioned Cormac McCarthy, uh, I remember buying The Road. Uh, and then reading it in one flight in which I was terrorized by the spareness of his language uh, from New York. Uh, I'd finished it by the time we landed in Amsterdam. And it made me, it reminded me actually of a, of a criticism somebody in The Guardian had of your book, of your style. Can I just get you to respond to this? Oh, great. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read it. It says, uh, Doors Pro style is high-pitched, operatic, relentless. Short, sharp sentences echoing the static of radios. That's nice. Make the first hundred pages very tiresome to read, as does the American idiom. No noun sits upon the page without the decoration of at least one adjective, and sometimes, alas, with two or three. Eyes are wounded, nights are luminous and starlit, seagulls are alabaster. Fields enwombed with hedges is almost the last straw. <laughs> what do you think when you hear that? Uh, you know, you think, I don't want to hear it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's fine. It's, um, it's life. You know, that's what making things and putting them out into the world of capitalism is about. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's painful. Anytime you make something, th this book in particular has really changed my feeling about reviewing. I, you know, reviewed fiction for the New York Times for a while and, um, you just realize, you know, people are taking such a risk with their lives to make things, and um, it's better just to give something no attention, I think, if, if you don't um, appreciate it and, you know, try to find things. So that's what I try to do in my column of science books, especially if the book isn't working for me. I, you know, I feel like such limited space in the newspaper anyway, I'll just try to find a book that is working for that particular month, you know, that I can write about. Next question. Anybody? I'll come over there. Okay. Anybody have a question? You looking at it? There we go, ma'am. I'm coming to you. Do you want to stand up? Hi. My name is um, my name is Debbie. Hi, Debbie. I read your book. I thought it was beautiful. Thank you. I think your words are beautiful, and I think you invoked a lot of emotion. I felt a lot of emotion, and I am not a professional reviewer from the Guardian, but I think the guy has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's nice, okay. Debbie. Thank That's you. Nice. Anybody have a question? Can we, yep, I'm coming to you, sir. Our first gentleman of the evening. Your name, sir? My name is Nick. Um, I was, so I'm uh, uh, doing a university bachelor degree in uh, pre-med, so biomed, but I also uh, do creative writing on the side. And I was wondering um, what advice you have to sort of uh, enter the industry I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Do people tell you not to do that? Or are people t telling you to choose? I don't know. They just mostly tell me to just write what I want. But Oh, yeah. good. That's good. <laughs> I think that would be my advice, is to read and read and read and write. Um, it's like any muscle. The more you use it, the better you'll get. And um, especially when you're young, read. Just find... Um, 
Atul Gawande. He's an American doctor, Indian American, who writes beautiful. He's got a beautiful book about death out right now. Um, you know, find models like that. There's a, um, a course, Chekhov. There's a writer named Ethan Kanan. Uh, all these medical doctors who are writing fiction. You know, Chekhov is the premier example. You know. Um, Find those examples of people who are trying to pursue both paths that seem opposite to people, and read and, and you know relish in language. There's nothing. What could be better than a medical doctor who can communicate very clearly to his or her patients through story? You know, Cutting for Stone is another book. Um, what is that writer's name? Uh, Abraham Verghese. Yeah, he's a medical doctor who writes fiction as well. Next question. Does anybody have it? Yes, ma'am. Your name is? Um, I am Karen Dorr. Oh. <laughs> I'm born in, uh, in Holland. And um, your story resembles the story of my father, who was a radio technician in wow. Rotterdam. Really? Um, wow. in, he was 16 when the war started in 20. One when it's finished, and he was doing the um, um, high technical school in Rotterdam, and he was a radio technologist. So <laughs> this was wow. a very very strange story to me. Okay. Um, uh, this is the Dor family in Holland, <laughs> and my father crazy. went to the States um, about 25 years ago to live there. So. <laughs> It's, it's funny. And I, I wonder if um, this Dorr family um, went to the States, your Dorr family went to the States uh, some generations before, because my, uh, the rest of the family uh, went to the States um, in the 30s. And only my uh, grandfather, Abraham Dorr, stayed. Wow. And passed the war, so it's it's funny. <laughs> yeah, that's Fess amazing. up, Anthony. Are you that's Dutch? Amazing. <laughs> it is astonishing. I wish I knew more. We don't know enough about my own genealogy, so I can't answer that question. I know there's German in there, but I don't know how many generations of this door family has been in the states. I mean, one of the mysteries of writing books is that they go out in the world and find readers. That's so amazing coincidence. It's so beautiful. I love that. That if I get hit by a bicyclist, as I did almost a hundred times today, <laughs> uh, you know, and never exist, at least that the something I made might be able to reach you and that it can remind you of your well, father. I, it's amazing. I can tell you that you even resemble my great grandfather on this <laughs> picture. Yeah. Look at you. That's that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. It's a pleasure to meet you. Any questions from anybody unrelated to the author? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, hi, my name is Darlene, and you obviously love writing about science and about nature. And I was just wondering if you um, could comment on the fact how in most, we also heard a lot about fairy tales and how this resembled a fairy tale in some way, and how most modern fairy tales put technology and science in the domain of the bad guys, mm. which very much happened in, in, in Nazi Germany also in this book, and mm. that nature, and I'm, I'm thinking about things like, um, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings and, I mean, modern fairy, fairy tales where technology mm. is usually used for evil and nature brings out our good side. And I wonder if you could comment on that and how you feel about that in your own book. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, I think about at least... Um, in terms of technology in the book, uh, uh, I think about it as being a neutral entity that's being used in both ways. You know, it's being used in the resistance so much that, you know, Etienne is risking his life just to play music, just to really have autonomy over what is being broadcast. I think that's a beautiful thing and, uh, and equally as powerful as the um, propaganda uses of radio. But while I was working on the book, I'm going to get some of these things wrong because I haven't thought about it until you brought it up for years. But um, there was supposedly, um, in the genocide of Rwanda, you could map the levels of violence by the, um, the strength of radio broadcasts and how um, radio personalities were really fomenting violence and that once you were outside the range, you really uh, the violence dropped off significantly. 
you know, there's such a graphic way, especially when you see these maps in this paper of how you know technology is really serving evil in that sense. And that immediately makes me think of ISIS and these strangely polished videos that they're making now and how they're being used to radicalize and separate people and, and kind of like I was trying to talk about at the end of my talk, how they're used to minimize the complexity of individuals. Um, so yes, in those senses, of course, um, it fits your thesis that, yes, in fairy tales, technology is a sort of vehicle for evil. But at the same time, I think about all the miracles. You know, my children were going to be in Europe for almost three months, and they're able to text their grandparents pictures and say, this is the Louvre, Grandma, and instantaneously. You know, that's an amazing thing. And they still feel connected to their friends and family at home. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't change that. I wouldn't change the access we have, the demo democratization of information that outside of... Um, Places, some places in China and Russia where state media is really controlled, lots and lots of people are finding ways to educate themselves because of technology, and that's a bright thing, and that's a good sign. Yes, sir. Your name? Hi, I'm Jan Bruckner. Um, I'm a social scientist, and I, I write a lot of stuff. I, I write journal articles, technical papers, and I think of it as a creative act sort of like writing fiction, but I wonder, since you obviously have one foot in sort of science writing and, and that type of thing, what do you think the connection is between technical scientific writing and writing fiction? Hmm. That's a great question. I mean, I think they're just both ways to communicate um, uh, and to educate. Uh, and uh, I think they're very similar. I mean, when you're sitting down to write those papers, you're doing the exact same thing I'm doing, which is trying to translate experience into language. And um, and I think the, the thing that fiction writers have an advantage of is that for some reason, whether it's evolution or it's our training since youth, narrative is this drug that people want more and more of. There are, I'm sure, a lot of people in here who have binge-watched something on Netflix, and that's because they are drawn to narrative. And uh, for me, you know, even the greatest explicators, whether it's literary theory or it's evolutionary theory, they're somehow using narrative. Somebody like E.O. Wilson or um, Richard Dawkins, um, they're somehow tying into that drug, that, that um, withholding information and giving information towards the end of a narrative, this shape of an arc and a resolution that uh, I'm drawn to. So I think, you know, of course there are similarities, but anytime there's narrative, my attention goes up a little bit more. I want to know what's going to happen to an individual and a story. And that's why I choose to tell stories, I think, because I like reading them. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Uh, next question. Anybody have a question? Let me turn around. Anybody from the back there? Because I haven't gone there yet. Oh, I have missed it. Ah, I'm coming to you. Here I come. Yes, sir. Your name? My name's Henri. I actually two questions. Uh, your house when you were growing up, what kind of home was it like? What were your parents like? Because it sounds fascinating. Uh, my mom is a science teacher, and my dad uh, runs, still runs a printing company with four employees. They make decals that go on trucks, big stickers, and we were surrounded by books. And um, in many ways, um, uh, I worry for my children in that they have so many options for what to do on a weekend or after school. You know, there's so many video games they can download or, um, you know, shows to watch just alone on Netflix. You know, we had three channels growing up. We had an antenna on the roof and we had three channels. And uh, so uh, we were outside all the time. And we lived in a pretty rural area of Ohio and, you know, fishing and swinging from trees all day long. And and my mother just trusted us to keep ourselves alive in a way that I wish I could with my own children. Like, evolution is not programmed to die, but I keep thinking, like, hey, they're going to tip off into the canal at any moment, you know? But they're going to be fine, but they, I just, I can't help myself from worrying about their location. I think somehow fear is so much more of a part of parenting, at least in the United States now, than it was for my mom and dad. And, um, so yeah, my dad would get home from work and he would maybe ask us some questions, but he would also make a drink and sit down <laughs> for dinner. And I get home and I'm playing with Legos with them and go out to the driveway and playing basketball with them right away. And 
I, it's just different, I think. But I hope that I'm giving them some autonomy to, you know, I think, I think you were saying, Jonathan, to get out of the way. You know, that's like the best parenting is just yes. to get out of the way in some ways. Yeah. Um, does anybody have another question? A burning question that must out? No? Then I think we more or less come to the end, so I'm going to ask my, my final question here. Okay. Which is, uh, you know, a lot of people have read your book. I think a lot more are going to read it. Certainly a lot of people here tonight are going to go read it. Uh, and by the way, you can go to the back and you can buy it as well. Maybe, maybe you can get it signed. Yes? Sure. Um, but what is the one thing you want people to think when they read the last word on the last page and close the book? What's the one thing you want them to think or feel? Oh, that's nice. I mean, I can be flip and say that they didn't waste their time. You know, that's, I just feel, but I do feel that so much. When my first, um, uh, my publisher in the United States is a publisher called Scribner. It's a very old publisher. and They published um, uh, Hemingway and Fitzgerald. And uh, when I, my first book got taken, uh, I went to New York City to give a reading. And, you know, I thought, this is it. Like I've got, I'm 28 years old and I've got the, one of the oldest publishers in the United States. Like I've made it. And then I think it was my second reading on this little tour and it was in New York City and it was in a Barnes and Noble, which is a very big chain bookstore. And the reading was like on the fifth floor and they take these escalators up and there's just books all through those floors just going past me. And you know, they're all big and you know, many of them are face out and they have, you know, maybe like three copies of my book and they're all spying out, you know, on the shelf and they're just lost in this multitude of books. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, you have to be as generous as you can in every sentence and be as careful as you can in every sentence because you're so lucky that a reader is willing to spend even one half hour of her life with your book. And that she has so many other alternatives, uh, better alternatives. She should just be reading Edith Wharton right now, not you. <laughs> so uh, the fact that she's willing to get there, I feel like I, I owe it to her to try to uh, reward her with being as careful as I can with research and language and uh, reminding her of the strange miracle of being alive. And so um, I hope that you feel like, that she feels like she hasn't, um, misspent her eight hours that she spent in the world you made. Ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Doerr. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Jonathan's introduction will be on our website tomorrow if you'd like to reread it and reconsider it. I'd like to suggest that you follow us on, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, John Adams NL. Consider also, if you haven't already, signing up for our newsletter to stay up to date on all the interesting things that we do. And above all, tell a friend. Bring a friend next time. Next time will be April 16th. I think we'll have a really interesting evening again with George Packer, who is a journalist at The New Yorker and has written a book called The Unwinding, The Inner History of 30 Years in America, about basically how the country is falling apart. <laughs> interesting reading as we move towards next year's elections. On the 26th of May, we will have an evening with Jerome Carabell, who is from the University of Berkeley, together with Alexandre Rinoy Kahn, and they'll be talking about uh, admissions policies at the Ivy League universities in the US and also admissions in the Netherlands and how the two systems compare and the advantages and disadvantages of both. We'll be holding that at the International School in Amstelveen, and I'm happy to say that the International School's director, Ed Green, is here with us this evening. Welcome, Ed, thank you for joining us. And on June 2nd, we'll have an evening with a young woman writer named Leslie Jameson, who has written a book about pain called The Empathy Exams. It's, she's very young, it's her first book. It's gone off the charts and it's a, 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 a really heavy hitting series of uh, essay studies about pain, physical, uh, mental, and about empathy for other people's pain. And we're doing that event uh, with a new partner for this time with the School of Life. I want to thank People's Place for hosting us this evening, 
And I want to thank Anthony's Dutch publisher, <laughs> Dutch publisher called the House of Books. <laughs> Maybe you can explain that to me later, why you're called the House of Books. Um, we hope you'll buy the book, uh, do buy the Dutch edition if you do speak Dutch, and I'm sure Anthony will be happy to sign. And uh, I just wanted to end the evening by telling you a couple of wonderful coincidences I discovered just this evening sitting here listening to Anthony Doerr. I too wanted to be a marine biologist. I gave up on that when I discovered that it was very cold and very dark way down deep in the sea. And then I decided that I would be a truck driver. <laughs> so it can change. As a matter of fact, I also took Russian at college just for the fun of it. So there have been, I think, more striking coincidences uh, in your family line, but uh, I thought there were some uh, amazing coincidences here too. And I really will take with me some of the heartening and inspiring things you said about bringing science and arts and literature together and about how um, you're translating into the, translating all these feelings and facts into language. And you do it beautifully, Anthony. Thank you for being here. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.